Hi, welcome everyone to the Washington Institute. Uh, here we are again, it's the fifth round of the Israeli elections of the last three and a half years. Many of you have been with us before. Uh, it's a great honor uh, for me, both institutionally and personally, to have a colleague and I could say a close friend, uh, Tamar Herman, to be joining us uh, from Tel Aviv. Tamar is the as a senior research fellow at the Israel Democracy Institute and the academic director of the Viterbi Family Center for Public Opinion and Policy Research for almost 30 years. She has produced uh, critical indices of Israeli public opinion, such as the monthly index that she's been doing for since 1994 to 2018, uh, the Israel Democracy Institute index, the Israel Voice Index. I consider her uh, really uh, Israel's leading pollster, and it's really a, an honor for me to have, have her join me. Um, I should introduce myself, I guess, because I'm both moderating and speaking. I'm David Murkowski, a Ziegler Distinguished Fellow here at the Washington Institute and the director of the Coret Project on Arab-Israel Relations. Um, also, creator of a podcast, Decision Points, that is about to start its fourth season on Monday. So I hope you all, uh, wherever you get your listen to your podcast, you'll tune in. Um, and um, I've written several books uh, relating to U.S. Israel relations and to uh, Israeli politics as well. So it, it's a delight um, to really to be with Tamar and the way we're going to do it is Tamar is going to start off, then I'm going to pick it up. Uh, I hope to ask some questions. We'll have a conversation and we will, uh, you know, please send in your questions. Uh, I think you know how to do it. And uh, we're just uh, delighted to really untangle this issue as Israel goes to the polls this Monday, November 1st, for the fifth time in three and a half years. Uh, as they say in Hebrew, Manish Tana, what's different, Tamar? I can't hear. I don't know if you're muted or maybe it's a problem on my side. Uh, can okay. you see? Make sure. Um, there we go. The elections are going to take place uh, on Tuesday. And uh, this indeed, as you mentioned, will be the fifth time in three and a half years. And it is uh, very interesting to try and figure out, is this uh, cycle of election going to be any different than the former ones? And uh, in, in which uh, way? Uh, I'll start by saying that uh, normally, when you look at the uh, um, younger age cohort, which is very large in Israel because we are a very young society, we tend to assume that a young voter is also a new voter. This is not the case this time because we have people who are now 20, even 19 and six months, they will vote for the fifth time in the life, normally it takes 20 years in order to get to this kind of electoral experience. But uh, I, I'm mentioning it because uh, in, in a way, uh, this tells us uh, that um, people are getting used to a constant situation of election campaigns. And, and, and this, in a way, of course, is very problematic from the democratic point of view, but it also uh, encourages people to be more politically engaged, because even if you decide not to vote, which is not the case uh, in, uh, in the Jewish public, the Arab public is, is different uh, in this direction, we have no indication that the turnout will be lower than it was in previous elections, which means around 70%, uh, 70 and over, because many of the eligible voters do not live in Israel, and, and, and therefore of those living in Israel, it's over 70%. 
which signals that Israelis uh, may be uh, angry about their politicians, may be angry about the system, may be disillusioned uh, about Israeli uh, democracy, but they are still heavily engaged. And indeed, in the latest publication of the Economist uh, Unit uh, Democracy Index, uh, they gave Israel a total of 100% in political engagement. We are at the top with no way, okay? So at least from that point of view, this is the first good news. I'll have only one good news at the end, uh, but, but basically the fact that people are interested and people are talking about politics, even if they say I'm fed up with politics, it means that they relate to what's happening on the, the political level. And also people feel some attachment when we ask them, is there a party that you feel that uh, properly represent your views? Uh, if you we take together those who are saying, yes, there is such a party, or there is a, a party that is pretty close to my uh, political uh, views and attitudes, we get a majority. Okay, so people are uh, involved in, in politics. We also ask them several times throughout these years um, to uh, either confirm or, or say no to the statement. It doesn't matter who you vote for because nothing changes. And every time we have over 60% and above, by the way, who are saying, yes, it does matter who you vote for. Okay, it means that people do not see, you know, some kind of uh, of, of uh, um, a gray background against which all parties look the same, all uh, politicians do look the same, and they have their preferences. Even if they do not vote, they have their preference. I'll give you an example. For example, former voters of Yamina party, Bennett's party, they find themselves in a very difficult situation because it seems that Ayala Chaked and the remains of Yemina uh, who, who joined Bait UD, for example, uh, uh, they seem to be uh, below the threshold, okay? So they don't know what to do. They have either an option to vote for a non-religious party, and if they want to vote for a religious party because they are mostly religious, they'll have to vote for Smotrich and Benkvir, Tzionu to the Tit, or to the ultra-Orthodox Shas or uh, Yadut Torah. So they find themselves in a situation in which they can uh, vote for a party which they are quite far from or not to vote at all. And indeed, we see uh, that amongst these voters, 25% and over say that they haven't decided or that they are not going uh, to vote at all. This is something that is significant because it may change the entire balance or imbalance between left and right in Israel. What we see now, uh, the two camps uh, are very, very close. Uh, <laughs> sorry. They are really very close, not only numerically, they are close in the sense that this is where the main split within Israeli politics is. Uh, and, and, and therefore, if we'll have a sixth election campaign or seventh, it wouldn't change the situation, at least not until uh, Netanyahu leaves uh, uh, the Likud party. If he leaves the Likud party, then many people who uh, plan on voting or voted in the past, for example, so the, what we call now Machanem Amlachti, it used to be blue and white. They changed names uh, by the day. Uh, and, uh, but they, many of them define themselves as being on the right. At least 50% are saying we are on the right side of the political spectrum and they wouldn't vote for Likud because Netanyahu is there. But if Netanyahu goes, Apparently, the difference between left and right will be much clearer because everyone who really thinks right will move electorally right. And, and uh, uh, this is why uh, uh, many 
observers of the political scene here are saying that it is probably the last time that we see Netanyahu uh, as the head of, of, uh, of the Likud because the, he didn't uh, succeed in creating a stable coalition for so many times and the age factor. And actually Smotrich was recorded saying that either physics or biology that will uh, uh, lead Netanyahu out of the uh, uh, political scene. And of course, the, the, the case court against him is also something that is progressing very slowly. But uh, uh, some of the people who are not uh, going to vote for Likud base their uh, uh, decision on what they heard in the previous meetings of uh, the court. Uh, and uh, uh, they are temporarily uh, putting themselves at the center, but this is not the natural uh, place And we know that when we ask people, uh, where do you put yourself politically, not what did you vote or what are you going to vote, we have over 60% saying we are on the right side. Uh, on the left, we have 12% in a very good day, can move between 10 to 14%, and the rest are in the center. And this is also something that uh, should be mentioned, that whereas the center uh, in the past was considered to be some kind of um, uh, a climate kind of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of parties, which means that they didn't have an agenda. Nowadays, they managed to establish themselves as parties with specific agenda. It's very difficult to say what are the differences between say a Gantz party and the Yeshatid Lapid's party, but they have uh, uh, managed to, to create some kind of a worldview that is projected much more clearly than in the past to, to uh, uh, the voters. It is very interesting to see the changes in, in, in the uh, party map uh, throughout these three and a half years, uh, because uh, the list of the parties uh, has been changing constantly. And, and when we do polls, we have to amend our list every time and then to decide when we ask them, what, who did you vote for and what are you going to vote uh, uh, next? And we, we, we can't really do the matching because the names of the parties are not the same. So we cannot uh, really tell you whether they stay with the same party or that just the party either uh, merge with another party or uh, uh, really dropped out of, of, of the list. And the most interesting thing in this regard is what happened with the Arab party, because uh, we used to have uh, for years now, the joint list, which at its peak uh, succeeded in getting 15 seats. And nowadays it is split. Uh, it is split in a way that Balad, the, the more nationalistic uh, faction, left it. They are not going to cross the threshold, but they are attracting many votes, mainly of younger, more educated and uh, Arab-Israeli intellectuals. Uh, some Israeli Jews also are going to vote for them. It's much easier for them than to vote for, say, a communist party like uh, uh, Hadash or uh, the Islamic party of, of Ram. So those on the left, the Israeli Jews who vote very much to the left or not the Zionist left at least, uh, are now uh, in, in a very strange situation, let alone the Israeli Arabs, the Israeli Arabs uh, who are really uh, um, they, they are very hurt by this uh, uh, new split. And whenever we ask them, are you for a, a new reunion of the parties, we have over 70% saying, yes, we want every party together, Ram and Balad and, and, and uh, uh, the Hadash party and, and Tal party. Uh, they understand that uh, uh, with this uh, split, they may go down to eight in eight seats in, in, in the best scenario and even less because there might be a situation in which Ram will not cross the threshold, Balad will not uh, cross uh, uh, quite 
uh, surely. And then uh, uh, the ability of the Arabs to, to have an impact on Israeli politics is very, uh, is going to, to almost diminish. Um, and then uh, we see almost no transition of people from one uh, uh, camp, political camp to the other. In the past, there were many people standing or sitting on the fence and uh, making the decision at the very last minute whether to fall this way or that way. We don't see it uh, uh, this time. All the movements are within uh, uh, these camps, between merits and labor, labor and merits, uh, labor and, and, and Yashatid, Yashatid and Gantz, but also the transition is not uh, really highly noticeable. It happened on, on the right side with the uh, people moving, a certain kind of people moving from Likud to Smotrich and Bengvir, and also from Yadut Torah to Smotrich and, and Bengvir, and some of those who were left without a party uh, because of what happened uh, uh, to Yemina. Uh, and, and this is very interesting because the, actually this union between Smotrich and, uh, and, and, and Ben Gvir uh, is the hand making of Netanyahu. Remember before the last elections, he put tremendous pressure on, uh, on um, uh, Smotrich to join forces with Ben Gvir, who was then at the very margin of the Israeli political map. Now this guy is playing a major role and if the surveys and the polls are uh, correct, they will be the third party in terms of the number of the seats that they are going uh, to get. But what happened was that Netanyahu uh, uh, um, let the genie out of the bottle and it's very difficult for him or impossible for him to put it back into the bottle. And now, uh, we were used to say that uh, Netanyahu is drinking votes from other party with a straw. And apparently now uh, what Smotrich and Benvi are doing is uh, they are taking votes with buckets, not with a straw from uh, uh, Likud. And uh, who knows what will happen there, but uh, this uh, also by doing what he did before the last election, he actually legitimized uh, Ben Gvir as uh, uh, a legitimate actor in uh, uh, the political game. And uh, once the, the prime minister is doing it, many people are saying, okay, so maybe this guy is not so terrible if our beloved prime minister is saying it. So maybe we will vote uh, for him. Uh, and uh, young people find him very attractive because he is anti-establishment, he is not considered as corrupt, only as a racist, but not as a corrupt politician. Uh, and uh, uh, we see, of course, ultra-Orthodox, young, mainly males voting for him, uh, young uh, national religious uh, uh, people, again, males, and also young secular uh, uh, people. Uh, who uh, favors him over the options that are more uh, complex and complicated. Young people don't like a uh, complex agenda. They, they prefer something that is clear cut. And he gives them that uh, in a very understandable phrasings, unlike others that seem to be uh, a bit uh, 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 more uh, uh, complicated. Um, there is one issue that I'll uh, uh, like to add. Uh, I see I finished my uh, 15 minutes. Uh, what we see is an increase in the number of uh, the people who say that uh, they uh, are skeptical whether the official results of uh, the elections will correctly reflect the real voting patterns. We are now at 39% total, 51 amongst the, amongst the Arab, 30, 36 amongst the Jews. We were there uh, 
uh, in uh, 2019s, but uh, uh, the commission that is in charge of the elections in Israel made some uh, uh, extreme efforts in order to make people uh, uh, believe that the, the, the results are the real results and they uh, managed to increase the public trust in the published uh, uh, results. But it seems that now with uh, the encouragement of certain politicians, which I will not name, uh, they are adopting the Trump uh, uh, kind of uh, rhetoric that the deep state and the system is the uh, actually working against them. And therefore, if they lose the elections, it is not necessarily because not enough people gave them their, their vote, but because uh, they will distort uh, the, the final results. Okay, on that cheerful note, uh, Tamar, I wanna thank you uh, for your remarks. I have some questions which I'll pose and then we'll go to our audience. And just again, for our audience, just to be clear, for if you have questions, email them to Policy Forum at WashingtonInstitute.org. Policy Forum at WashingtonInstitute.org. All right, so I want to talk about a few issues. Um, first, the stakes of this election. Uh, what is this election about? Uh, this is not an election based on a policy difference. Uh, we've seen uh, a few times before, Netanyahu ran on the idea of the West Bank annexation. There have been uh, uh, elections about peace plans. There, uh, this is not an. Everyone is complaining about the rate of inflation, which is worldwide uh, in both parties. But no side has really put forward a plan to say, well, you know, we'll have lower interest rates or we'll have higher interest rates or this is my eight-point plan to combat inflation. In other words, the idea of of this being a policy election, I think, is it would not be accurate. I do think it could be something more foundational, uh, maybe some would say existential. Uh, and that is, I think, a question of the independence of the judiciary. Uh, there's something called a French bill also that would deal with um, you know, a prosecution of politicians uh, at the time that they're no longer in politics and more critically allow the Knesset to overturn Supreme Court decisions, uh, having a more majoritarian kind of approach. And it's also about whether uh, a hard right party uh, of, uh, you'll hear the names, Basal el Smotrich, but as Tamar correctly said, Itamar ben Gvir is what, this guy has really captured attention of young people, uh, particularly uh, young males in the ultra-Orthodox, in national religious, and even as Tamar said, it's secular. He he went to a to a, a high school in in Herzliya where he was mobbed because he comes with very uh, black and white answers. He likes to do. He's a provocateur du jour. He sees a television camera. He sees a, a melee uh, with Arabs, and he he goes right dives right into it. Um, so is and this is someone who is called for the expulsion of Arabs, although he claims now that he's no longer the Kahanist he was, but for decades, where he spoke annually at, at Kahana's memorial. And um, and the question is, is he going to be a senior minister? Uh, so are we going to see a mainstreaming of the hard right in Israeli politics? I think taken together, it raises the question if, you know, democratic norms are, seem to be um, clearly on the ballot. This is a different kind of election than Israel faces. I know people could say, ah, we've seen elections come and go. But I think, and uh, uh, Tamar said it too, I think this is this is something different. You know, for those of you who don't follow this, every nuance, as I talk to an American audience, left, right in Israel is not about high taxes, low taxes, or the state or the role of the state in society. Since 1967, there's been a kind of a, a, an Israeli Cold War internally where right left has been about territorial withdrawal from the West Bank. Does this make Israel more secure? Does it make Israel more vulnerable? That has been the classic kind of left right. Tamar is right that the, there's not much of the left left in a certain way that um, 
that is the, the Israeli political spectrum has shrunk a bit between the right and the center, the center believing very much about Israel being, yes, a Jewish state, but a democratic state. And for the sake of Israel's democracy, it has to find ways of making uh, territorial compromise with the Palestinians. Maybe it doesn't believe like the left did in a more transformative effect of, of a Palestinian state. But uh, there's clearly difference. But as Tamar said correctly, if you look at the member of, of Knesset members, if you look at the Knesset members who say, would you call yourselves right or, or center left? Uh, according to my account, in the current Knesset, 72 out of 120 would identify, self-identify as being on the right. And only 48. And this is something I remember Tamar in one of our previous sessions together, you talk about the self-identification, 62% of Israeli Jews, but 72 to 48. But why then isn't BB winning in a landslide? Why are the numbers, the, the it hasn't basically moved between the pro BB and the anti BB bloc where it's 60, 56, four. You know, why doesn't it align neatly with that 72, 48? And I think the reason is Netanyahu himself, because this is a different election. It isn't a classic left-right, there's left, center-left uh, versus right election. It's about Netanyahu, it's about his trial, and it's about the changing of democratic norms. And here that you have an anti-Netanyahu right, you never used to. People like a Victor Lieberman, people like Gidon Saar on the right, they feel that and, you know, you might say, well, this is maybe like Liz Cheney in America, or there might be other figures. I'm trying to put this always in an American context. But there are people here on the right that, that do not identify uh, with the prime minister. So it's much closer. And the polls have hardly moved. Uh, but when we talk about the stakes, there are stakes here in terms of Israel's foreign relations. You know, I have it on good authority that these media reports are indeed accurate where the UAE, kind of the crown jewel for Israel with the Abraham Accords, where relations have taken off like a rocket ship over the last two years, where you've had 500,000 Israelis go to the Emirates during a pandemic. Imagine what there's no pandemic, where uh, trade is over $2 billion just in the last two years, that they say if there's a hard right government with Mr. Ben Gvir, this will hurt Emirati-Israeli relations. It's, these are not just media reports. And as Tamar said, the fluidity is not really much between the blocks. There's some fluidity within the blocks. And I saw an interview on one of the Israeli television channels last night in prime time that uh, Prime Minister Lapid had, where he said there's basically 60,000 voters. You know, when uh, 60,000 voters is a seat and a half in Israel given the millions who, who can vote. I mean, the whole country is only 9 million people, but still, of the millions who could vote, it's 60,000, Lapid said, who could move from the pro-BB bloc to the anti-BB bloc. He said 300,000 haven't made up their minds, but maybe 240,000 of them are debating within the bloc, but 60,000, a seat and a half, that's it. No more than a seat and a half are debating uh, between the blocs. Um, so I think that that's interesting. If you look at the, and we have some polling numbers. So, so, I mean, you, you saw on the one slide there that the numbers have, have really been fairly, uh, very, uh, static. Uh, but we are seeing that within the blocks, Likud has dropped from like 35 to 31. Uh, thanks to Mr. Ben Gvir, who has seemed to have been the phenom of this election. Has he peaked too early? We'll find out. Often there's a surprise in the Israeli election. Tomorrow will be the last day under Israeli law that polls are allowed to be print published because there's a system where they don't want the polls to, too much to influence the public. So we'll see the, the weekend papers tomorrow. But So maybe will there be other surprises? But Ben Gvir has steadily gone up. He's gone up for the reasons that Tamar said. I would add another one. I think the sense of violence... Uh, in the streets, uh, the violence in Janine and Nablus, and I'll come back to it, has has actually once again, uh, you know, has, has moved people uh, to the right. And and Ben Veer has been the uh, beneficiary of that. 
if there's an asymmetry between the, the, the pro-BB block and the anti-BB block, look at this slide we're going to show you. And this slide shows, if you look, basically, all the risks um, uh, are to who could not make the threshold are coming from um, the, uh, the parties on the left. In other words, the, the parties on the right are pretty solid. You know, they could have 31. You need, remember, you need four seats. That's 3.25% to get in the Knesset. So all of them are, are safely in that zone. There's nobody, Likud 31, uh, Ben Gvir, Smotrich 14, Shas 8, Aguda, uh, United Toward Judaism 7. No one's teetering. But look at the center left. You labor at four, uh, Ram of Mansour Abbas at four, Merits at four, uh, the, um, the joint list people at four. If any of those people don't make it in, their votes go down the drain. And there's a redistribution, and that will help the other side. So um, there's a saying, uh, a, a, a sophisticated political saying in Israel is called the Yiddish word, gewalt, like oi gewalt, oi ve, uh, woe is to me. And these parties crying, we're about to be go under, we're about to go under. And there's been tension between Lapid and these smaller parties of labor and merits saying, hey, you want parity with the Likud. Your numbers might be growing, but uh, Channel 13 has, as Lapid at his highest number, he's been at 27, and he's like within striking range. But they'll say it doesn't matter how many votes you got. The goal is to get to 61, and if the block doesn't do as well, it doesn't matter what the party within that block does. So I would say the drama is more on the center left uh, because four of these parties uh, might not make it across the threshold. So, you know, I think that's something worth saying. Um, um, but I think Lapid clearly w wants to enlarge his party. He's a bit afraid that a third party that Tamar mentioned, uh, uh, sometimes it's called the, the, the General's Party, General uh, Benny Gantz, General Gadi Eisenkot, um, you know, that, uh, that they might try a third party way to woo some of the ultra orthodox. I think it's a low probability thing. We'll talk about it in a moment. But I think it's clear that Gantz wants to say this is a two person race. It's me and BB. And, uh, and the small parties think that's sh short sighted if one of them don't cross the threshold. Let's be clear and, and obviously no disrespect to Tamar, who's really at the top. But there are limitations to polling in Israel. Uh, sometimes sample sizes on television, which is where people get their news often, is, is small. And therefore, the polling is within the margin of error. Uh, well, I think there's been over 70 polls. And that to me, there, that does must mean something, that they're all basically converging in the same way. There's no wild fluctuations. They're all saying the same. But we're talking, unlike the American system and from our American Viewers, we're used to two parties, Democrats and Republicans. We're talking about a multi-party system. So th the chances of error of one party not crossing the threshold, like I said, could, could skew the results. Uh, and finally, uh, another element that could limit polling uh, data. And now I, I'm, you know, I'm sophisticated pollsters like Tamar and others, uh, you know, I think correct for this. You have a phrase in England called the shy Tories that sometimes the people on the right don't always tell the pollster uh, where, where their thinking is because they think the pollsters are somehow part of a cultural liberal elite. And in Israel, you've got ultra-Orthodox, uh, Israeli Arabs, you've got uh, Russian immigrants, don't come from a democratic tradition. And uh, do we know if they're fully truthful with the pollster? So, but now there's efforts to try to correct for that, but it's something you need to take into account. Tamar mentioned turnout, and we had a poll that uh, we had a, a slide that showed you that turnout in Israel is very high, 67 percent consistency, uh, consistently. And every pundit has come on before the next round and said, no, now I think the public's really tired. They're not going to come out. And they come out. They've come out during COVID. Uh, they, you know, it, it's it's remarkable. And as Tamar said correctly, the 67 figure is even higher because this includes eligible Israeli voters. And and, and, and many of them live abroad. So the figure really is over 70%. The, the drama is clearly on the Israeli Arab side. That's where 
a lot of the focus is in the media. And because, you know, after the third round, the Arabs had 15 seats. But after the fourth round, they only had 10. So their voting uh, numbers were cut by a third. And ironically, this happens because, and Netanyahu has learned from the third to fourth round, when he riled up the Israeli Arab sector, questioning, maybe we need more cameras in the polling station if we think there's fraud. That seemed to bring a lot of people out because they were angry. But when Netanyahu did the soft touch, actually visited Israeli Arab communities for the first time, when he called himself Abu Yair, the father of his son, uh, Yair Netanyahu, uh, it kind of put the Arabs to sleep. Some people thought that he was going to run a hard campaign against Mansour Abbas. I, I thought he wouldn't because he wants to put that sector to sleep, so to speak. He doesn't want uh, them to be riled up. Uh, and so, uh, and, and Lapid is also trying to thread a needle with the Arabs. He went to Nazareth, but he doesn't want to take any statements that would anger the Jewish public, but he wants to do outreach to the Arabs. He wants that turnout. Um, and by the way, I, you know, and here I want to be very cautious because, you know, we, we don't know this for sure. And we don't know for sure. We have to caveat, but be careful. But Israeli politicians have learned the dangers of doing big military operations on the eve of an election. Shimon Peres, 1996, called Grapes of Wrath. The Israeli Arabs stayed home. And Peres lost that election by seven-tenths of one percent. So uh, some people thought there was going to be a massive campaign now in the West Bank. Israel is acting in Janin and Nablus because it feels that the Palestinian Authority has left the vacuum when it comes to governance. But there has not been a massive uh, operation like in Gaza or anything like that uh, on the eve of an election. So what is the impact of the drumbeat of violence that's been gone on? We can't say for sure, but I think historically we could say that violence moves the Israeli public to the right. Um, and we've seen that. We've seen, you know, these spectacular attacks. There was a woman a, and a baby that were killed on the eve of an election in 90, in, in, in uh, 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 you know, a while back. And it moved like two to three mandates to the right. We saw that that polling data was showing us that during the Bennett government, the acceptance of Arabs in the coalition was more and more acceptable to, to all Israelis. There was questions whether this would they would have the 61st vote, but people thought it was good that the Arabs for the first time, the Mansour Abbas party, UAL, United Arab List, Ram, that they were part of the coalition. We saw the polling numbers rising even on the right. Here was someone who actually embraced the idea of Israel as a Jewish state. They never heard an Arab talk like that. The numbers were going up. Then Ramadan happens. 19 Israelis killed, and the numbers tank. And the parliamentarians from the right, who were part of Bennett's coalition, part of his Yamina party, uh, they, Edith Silman and others, said, talked about enormous pressure they were facing at home, and the coalition unravels. So the impact of violence seems to have helped Ben Gvir um, uh, in saying, um, you know, the, the, they're, they're not afraid of Israel anymore. I will re reinstill that sense of, of, of fear. But he's playing the people's fears. Um, and that has been part of his success. The last part I just want to get at uh, is uh, coalition scenarios. And look, it's, you know, I said that the polling could be within the margin of error. We always need to be humble, uh, those of us analysts, uh, because, again, as I said, one party doesn't cross a threshold it could change the dynamic, one or two seats. So even though the pollsters do an outstanding job, I think the, the, the good ones, uh, for the most part, it's, it's a very, very complex situation. Um, I think seem to think that, that there are just a few options here and that have um, implications uh, also for the United States. Um, look, I think for Netanyahu, if he gets 61 with Ben Gvir, the, the the religious Zionist party and with Shas and the United Torah Judaism, that that airtight coalition of four parties that have stuck together throughout throughout, um, I think he'll go for it. Uh, it seems to me because he could get Knesset legislation along the lines I mentioned above that would insulate him from uh, uh, prosecution. I think that would be uh, very meaningful uh, for him in terms of his trial. 
and he will think I will navigate the rest. I will once BB's, uh, you know, modus operandi is always lock up your 61 before the election already to kind of hand out the portfolios, do it quietly, but incentivize these guys to come out. Um, and, uh, and I think he will do that here. Uh, he wants to incentivize his coalition partners, but he wants to lock down. And once he's get his 61, now I'll go to the other side and I'll extend my hand to show that, uh, but the core is my people. Uh, that's, I think, his preferred option right now. Uh, I think there's little doubt. Yes, he's worried about the turnout day. And uh, BB goes around the country, he goes to shopping malls, he'll go to the beach. It's very televised, getting people to the polls. 200,000 of his voters stayed home last time. Um, but they stayed home Three. because they um, thought, he, I think either they thought he was going to win or maybe they were tired of him. But the fact that BB's running the first time from the opposition, it's not Lapid is running for the first time in, in five, uh, actually seven rounds with BB, five in this last three and a half years, but two before that. He's running as an incumbent. Uh, so BB's hoping, oh, you don't think your vote matters? Look what happened last time. You stayed home, and and I, I, I'm I'm now in the opposition. Lapid, on the other hand, is running a, I don't want to say a Rose Garden strategy, but he's running as I'm the incumbent. I just did, by the way, this maritime deal just happened, breaking news uh, within the last couple of hours that Israel and Lebanon now have a maritime border in the eastern Mediterranean. The question is, will it bring stability? But uh, he's focusing on running his, his accomplishments as prime minister. So turnout, different strategies to get the turnout. But I think in terms of scenario outcomes, Bibi would like to lock up his 61 if he could add beyond it to insulate himself in Washington, because he might fear Washington is not going to be receptive to a government where Ben Gvir is, you know, he wants a senior portfolio. Could he be the police minister? Who knows? But he knows that's not going to be popular. So can he add around it, but keep his 61 core and get his legislation passed and use the rest? Um, uh, you know, to, to, to try to mitigate uh, international fallout. What is the option for Lapid? If the polls are holding out and, and Lapid's block, the anti-Lapid group is only getting 56, that doesn't give him ideal options. Um, you know, one of two things, and I'll end with, with this thing in a moment, the, the option for Lapid would be, okay, I'm a caretaker till the sixth round. So, by the way, if you look at the four rounds, the first two, BB was the caretaker. So he was the prime minister beyond that first election of April. He stayed prime minister for another two years uh, when, there, when these results were inconclusive. The fifth round, the fourth and the fifth round were different. The fourth round, excuse me, the third and the fourth round were different, excuse me. The third and the fourth round, somebody crossed the aisle. Someone did something they said they wouldn't do. Gantz uh, said, OK, but I didn't count on COVID. This is a national emergency. I was the chief of staff of the army. When there's an emergency, the chief of staff salutes and, and joins. Uh, and in the fourth round, famously, Bennett, Naftali Bennett, crossed the aisle from the right to lead the change coalition, the anti-Netanyahu bloc. And there was right, center, and left. But uh, so will someone do that this time for Lapid? Uh, we, we'll have to see if they don't, if there's no breakaway from the Likud. Uh, which right now is hard to envisage. Um, but if there's not, then, you know, then Lapid is either a caretaker till the next round, or he does what Rabin did after the Oslo Accord, which is run a minority of government with a parliamentary safety net of, of the joint list people from Hadash and, and, and Ta'al, so uh, governing with under 61. Um, I think that's possible. I think... Um, I've come around to the view, though, that what could happen and people say, well, there wasn't voter fatigue last four times. What could be different? But if the public says, look, this is hopeless. We've tried this so many times. There's no decisive outcome. And the public is also worried that Ben Gvir will, will achieve too much prominence. And this is not good for Israel's uh, democracy. And it's not good for Israel's foreign relations with the United States or the United Arab Emirates or Europe. Uh, if there's a protracted stalemate where for a month or two, each guy tries every permutation possible, I do not rule out 
that there is going to be incredible public pressure for B.B. Lapid and Gantz to come together in a unity government. Uh, so you've heard it here. I, I do think that the public just thinks that this political instability is, is, is bad for Israel. They want the big parties to come together. Uh, and the question is, you know, will they do it? I think the math will determine that because I think if Bibi gets 61, his preference will be for a narrower government. But if he doesn't get it, I think a wider grand coalition could be possible. All right, why don't we stop here and let me go to Tamar and ask you, Tamar, uh, as you see, you know, e each side wants to enlarge the tent, you know, and the, the, the enlarging the tent means either often the Arab turnout or the soft right in Israel. Uh, who do you see between Bibi and Lapid as making gains in enlarging the, the tent versus just rearranging the chairs within the tent? This uh, round is also different by the statements made by the leaders of the Arab parties besides Ram that they are not going to give any candidate a support from the outside. So one of your options is seemingly off the table. We don't know whether they will stick to this. Uh, uh, That's the key question. <laughs> announcement. But I actually said that for the first time ever, and this is very different than than Robin uh, when uh, uh, Robin had his uh, uh, as min his minority government to start with he had eight, uh, 58. Now we don't see uh, Lapid's uh, uh, camp coming up to to 68 percent, and uh, 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 there was no such a resentment towards Lapid like there is uh, now following the May 21 events in the Arab uh, uh, public. So uh, it's quite questionable whether he can have a minority government supported from the outside by uh, uh, the uh, joint list and Balad will not cross Ram. Ram is uh, a, a possibility for both sides because Ram actually uh, um, discuss the possibility of supporting from the outside Netanyahu uh, in the former round. Now Netanyahu is always saying, and all his uh, people are saying, we are not going to join forces uh, either formally or informally with Ram. But if this will be his only way out, I see him making such a flip-flop and, 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 and finding excuse why it is preferable to have uh, a lefty government and so on uh, and so forth. Um, so I, I think that the uh, uh, potential uh, in, in uh, um, Netanyahu's hand to expand the, the tent is, is bigger. Uh, particularly as although again, Gantz is saying that he'll never ever believe him and uh, I think that under certain circumstances, COVID-wise, will not be COVID, but it may be Iran, maybe something else, he'll say uh, yes to, to Netanyahu, particularly if he can um, have some guarantees that he'll be the prime minister for at least the first two years. For him, being the prime minister is his person, personal passion. Uh, and he played his cards very badly last time, but I think that nowadays uh, the situation has changed. So I, I see more options on, 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 on the right, particularly as the left is also less coherent on so many other levels, right, uh, than, than the right. Netanyahu was uh, very successful in actually keeping them all uh, uh, together. They play their cards as a block, not as, as uh, distinctive parties. So when you have a team, uh, the team always uh, will be back at, better in manipulating such a situation than uh, uh, players that do not have 
very high commitment to to uh, each other. So this is fascinating. You think that Netanyahu has not given up on the Mansour Abbas option. In other words, bringing in Ram, the United Arab List, you know, he clearly wanted to do that last time, but Ben Gvir and Smotrich blocked it. You know, you could say he created a monster. He created this this hard right party because he saw right wing votes were going down the drain because they weren't going to cross the threshold and he forced them together. Now, do you think um, that they will react any differently to this time? I mean, this seems to be their calling card that they will not compromise on this. Uh, and also on the Mansoura Abbas thing, we've seen a new phenomenon. I'm just curious if it's showing up in your polls. I've seen it being discussed on Israeli television of Jewish voters voting for the Islamist party of Mansoura Abbas, believing that he did such a courageous thing by recognizing Israel as a Jewish state that people said he gets a half a seat of his four from Jewish voters. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if that's showing up in the polls. If that's if you see that as at all significant, but just how Netanyahu would navigate the you know the opposition from within, I agree with you a thousand percent that when it comes to coalition maintenance of of his group, he's airtight with um, the hard right and the ultra orthodox. They have stuck with him, um, and uh, but how does he navigate their veto, especially of the the Smotrich uh, Ben Gvir people? Okay, to start with, I'd like to react to the idea of uh, Ram getting half a, a seat from, from a Jewish voter. This is uh, totally fake news. I mean, if uh, Jews uh, uh, vote for an Arab party, they vote for Ballad, uh, that is modernist and, and nationalistic, and the joint list, if they are very much on the left side, uh, very few. I mean, that that's uh, uh, the power of TV, finding like five people who would testify that they are going to vote for Ram and then make a phenomena out of it. It, it doesn't uh, show anywhere uh, in, in, in hard numbers, uh, uh, not only with us, but also with others. By the way, in, in, in the Viterbi Center, we don't do uh, uh, this kind of... Uh, of service. We have the data, but we never release it because we don't want uh, to get into the guessing uh, uh, industry. Uh, and to, to Netanyahu, how will he manage? Um, I can see him offering such portfolios to Smotrich and Ben Gvir in order to compensate at least for Ram supporting him as the next prime minister, not necessarily making them part of uh, the coalition. And uh, I see Ram, Ram in the past agreed to, to uh, work with him uh, it, uh, officially or, or non-officially. Actually, the agenda of Ram and Shas is very, very close. I mean, social they, issues. Uh, uh, yeah. Religious Jews, and these are religious yeah. artists, but on many yeah. other issues. LGTB rights, women rights, and, and, and the rest of it, they are very close. Their ability to discuss these uh, ideological issues is much higher than a Mansour Abbas discussing these issues with Meirav Michaeli of labor, right? On, on so many issues. So I can see uh, this as, as the possibility with uh, much money, and giving away to the uh, Zionut Datit party uh, some more important uh, uh, portfolios. So let me ask you, Tamar, about you, something you said in your remarks. We've got a couple of questions on, from our Zoom audience on this, and that is the Likud without Netanyahu. Uh, uh, you said at one point, I thought I, if I heard you correctly, this could be his last chance. I know that on like an ultra-Orthodox magazine cover, that very popular, La Mishpacha, they said this is his last chance. But uh, others have said, look, he hasn't stopped until now. He's got very strong support within the rank and file. They see him as like the stone they throw at the world. They feel a sense of defiance of what they call, what they consider the cultural elite of the society, whether it's the judiciary, the media, the academia. Um, 
what would lead BB to actually quit? And if he did quit, what would uh, what would happen to the Likud in the in the post uh, BB era? Because we you know we hear that a lot of people are not just called right left Likud, not Likud. They're called Bibistim. They're they're Bibius. They they identify with him personally. So it's it's the likelihood of BB persevering as he has until now. Uh, and keeping his block together, or thinking about a post BB era, as you see it. Let's start with the man is over seventy, right? He should be seventy four right now. Right. So even his the strongest uh, uh, supporters and admirers do see in the horizon a time when he will not be there. Okay. So the question is when. And I suppose that uh, it depends much if he loses this time in terms of his ability to to create a a coalition, it depends uh, much on the deal that he can be offered regarding his case court. And uh, it seems that there were negotiations in the past in this regard, but he didn't get what he wanted. Uh, I can see, and that's, that's a wild guess. I can see President Herzog intervening in that uh, in order to release Bibi. I prefer Netanyahu, actually, because I, I find it difficult to, to, to call him Bibi. He's not a friend. He's a prominent politician. Uh, that's why I don't like the Bibi team title as well, because this this shows disrespect to, to these people, which I don't belong to, but I, I don't use it. So I can see him offering or intervening in order to offer him something that can let him off the hook uh, without disgrace. Uh, And I can see if this is put on the table, some pressures from within. I do not expect to see a revolt against him within his own people because there is uh, this sense of uh, uh, a mob family that you do not uh, really betray your uh, godfather or your, your your leader. This is something which is very typical to the left. I mean, on the left, uh, uh, you know, knives in the back is 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 the modus operandi, but not on 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 the right. So if it'll be offered something that it will be acceptable to him, and he will. Uh, um, project a sense of acceptance uh, of that and even take it formally, I can see him leaving. Now, what about Likud without Netanyahu? Uh, I saw someone saying that without Netanyahu, Likud is is nothing or or, or a very smaller party. I totally disagree with that because content-wise, attitude-wise, there are many more people who could vote for Likud and are not voting because of Netanyahu. I don't see Likud uh, shrinking uh, to less than 24 seats, uh, uh, which we expect uh, uh, Yeshati to get. Right. This, the, the bulk of the Jewish uh, Israeli public right. is. Right. We talked about this and in, in your polls about the self-identified. I think if I remember 62, 63 percent of Jews self-identify as being on the right. Um, it doesn't and mean they're higher. against. Yeah, maybe even higher. Uh, it doesn't mean against peace with uh, Arab states like the Gulf, uh, which they see great economic opportunity. They love uh, uh, this these kinds of peace agreements. But things that are uh, on its borders with the Palestinians in particular, is where uh, their skepticism is highest. And there's also worldview questions about the role of the judiciary that we have in our country too that are, uh, you know, that are n- n- not, um, you know, not unique to Israel. But um, I, di- I did get a question. And, but, and also, so, but if anything, the support on the right is, is wider right now. BB brings down the support, doesn't bring up the support. I agree with you. On the on the plea bargain, he wanted he he asked Aaron Barak, the eminent jurist, former head of the Supreme Court, kind of Israel's iconic figure, who's now like 93 years old, to inquire about a a plea bargain. 
And uh, but it was right at the end of the term of the attorney general, uh, Avi Chai Mandelblit. But it was clear that he was pursuing it. So you could uh, envisage uh, a situation where there is a a post BB world. The question is, is it coming now or not? And we'll have to uh, certainly uh, he he's persevered now. This is his fifth time and he feels the public support is is still there. But uh, we'll see how these elections turn out. I do see there's a, a question in the chat of someone who asked me about uh, uh, whether it's Jewish groups or non-Jewish groups here in the United States that have been coming out very uh, emphatically, um, should they come out emphatically on the Ben Veer question? And I think it's a dilemma for these groups for this reason. I don't think they're indifferent to the Ben Veer phenomenon. Almost all of these uh, national Jewish groups and the like in 2019, uh, and I was just going through this with a U.S. official yesterday, actually, said, you know, it, you know, the ra- racism is reprehensible. Uh, these groups have gone on the record, but th- I think they fear a backlash that not against them, but that he will use that to say, oh, outsiders are meddling. I saw that just today Ben Veer came out. Uh, Senator Menendez, who's a, who's a big senator on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Bob Menendez uh, said uh, a, U- a government with Ben Veer could you know, change U.S.-Israel relations. Um, and he immediately said, oh, that's, that's meddling on the outside. And he's counting on that to create a backlash among his voters uh, within Israel. So I, I think the, uh, the wrestling with this of these groups is a question of American values are very clear uh, and also Israeli values of, the, of the, the Israeli Declaration of Independence about equality. Uh, this, is, this was the founding of Israel, the founding ethos of David Ben-Gurion. Uh, and I could say, well, you know, things change over, over the decades. But I think most Israelis very b- believe this very strongly. But there's electoral calculus which is made, which is if you do that, do you play into his hands? Is he somehow able to use that to say outsiders are meddling and, that, and he'll get even higher numbers? I think that's the it's not the indifference to it. But clearly, if it's a, if it's a question of pure values, I do think there's, um, there's a real case to be made here. Uh, that this doesn't represent the values that are very much at the bedrock of U.S.-Israel relations. Um, and because U.S.-Israel relations have been about interests, but they've also, also been about values. And that's what has made this relationship so enduring, so durable, so resilient. So anyway, but these, these, the, there is a calculation here that would coming out against him help him. That's a big question. I think people in uh in the u.s are are grappling with i don't know if you have any thoughts on that tamar it depends when i mean certainly not before the elections uh because attacking him before the elections uh will serve him well uh so the elections it depends i uh, do not think that you can or, or you should attack him on on the um very abstract level of previous statements or whatever. Uh, I think that one should wait and see what happens, which portfolio is it going to get, if any, how uh, can he or uh, deal with uh, these sensitive issues. Um, there are two, two uh, kinds of uh, expectations. Uh, some people are saying, just give him the power and he will abuse it and, and, and take Israel to uh, a populist style, Orban or, or, or Modi or Bolsonaro or even worse uh, than that. Some are saying that once you are in office, then uh, uh, your practices are, are milder than your rhetoric before the elections. So I would say that reacting to his uh, uh, new political uh, uh, upgrade should wait until there is something concrete because otherwise it will be perceived by many as external intervention 
uh, in Israel's affairs. And let me uh, remind you that some of his initial support um, Netanyahu got from people who said he stood very firmly against Washington on certain issues. Uh, and regardless of what they thought about uh, the uh, uh, American demands uh, at that time, and certainly during Obama's time, uh, people supported Netanyahu because as if he showed some, uh, you know, very strong backbone uh, and, and, and uh, that he, he expressed uh, this national pride of not bowing to, to uh, uh, the United States. So I, I would be very, very careful here. Yeah, there's a story that uh, President Obama was very upset with when in 2015, uh, Netanyahu talked about the Arabs voting in droves, which created a huge firestorm in this country and in the US. And he wanted to come out right away and his advisors prevailed upon him to wait until the polls close, just a few more hours because they, they feared that backlash. So the, it's a real calculation. Uh, and um, But people feel the tug also worry about they don't want Israel to go the direction of Hungary or some of these other uh, countries as well, Poland and the like. Um, but look, I would, I would just, I'd like to end on an optimistic note. You know, I said that I think a lot is at stake. I do think the fact that, as you point out, Tamar, that Israeli political engagement is so high. You mentioned the Economist unit saying that it's like 100%. And we've saw, talked about the pollings that people have come out during COVID, during this is the fifth time, that the fact that the turnout remains so high and that people are, um, are so engaged, I have to think it says something about the resilience of the Israeli public that, that, that they have internalized that um, you know, democracy will not succeed if it is just the, the the preserve of the few, and that that to me that so many Israelis want to vote is a, is a sign that they care very much about Israel's democratic future. So we will have to see, but the stakes are high, and uh, I urge our um, our viewers on Zoom uh, to stay tuned, as we at the Washington Institute will no doubt and uh, hopefully with your help to uh, really parse over the results, understand the implications. It could be, as we said in our remarks, we won't know the results immediately. Uh, we often know the immediate results, you know, take hours and hours, but it's not just processing the numbers themselves. It's, it's all the implications of, of these scenarios for Israel's future. So I urge everyone to stay tuned, stay focused, uh, I want to thank you very much, Tamar, for joining us. Again, it's always a delight to be with you, and I urge our our um, our viewers to to watch what happens on November first, and also, like I said, on October thirty first, the day before the elections, the start of our fourth season of the podcast, Decision Points, interviews with authors on who've written books recently on U.S. Israel relations. Our first. Uh, book and author is going to be Walter Russell Mead, who's the um, columnist of the Wall Street Journal and just wrote a very thought-provoking book called The Ark of the Covenant, uh, which is uh, focused on the history of the U.S.-Israel alliance. So I urge you all to stay, stay focused, whether it's the podcast on Monday, Israeli elections on Tuesday, and thank you all for uh, tuning in to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Thank you all very, very much. Thank Have you. a good day. Thank you, Tamar.